So now we're going to start some videos on hypothesis testing. And so let's start with what is a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is simply defined as whenever you make a statement about a particular population. So you might ask, you might make a statement about their average height or even their particular response to a drug. So you'll remember there's really no way that we could know what these two things are, the average height or the response to the drug for the entire population. So this is our guess. This is our best guess. And for researchers, there's really two kinds of hypotheses. Research hypotheses and statistical hypotheses. So the research hypothesis is the guess that you have that is driving your research. So maybe you're looking at a particular drug and you're thinking, I think that patient's blood pressure will drop with this medication. And you may develop that hypothesis based on years of experience uh, using similar drugs or past research that you looked at in animal models or other things that kind of inform your, your research hypothesis. Now a statistical hypothesis is stated in a way that you can statistically test that hypothesis. So in our example, you might say that. So you might say that the if you have to phrase it in a way that it can be statistically tested. So you can say that uh, in men 40 to 60 years old, the mean drop in blood pressure in that population who are taking the medication will be 10 millimeters of mercury. So for hypotheses testing, we're really going to be talking about statistical hypotheses. So you need to be able to form your research hypothesis into a statistical hypothesis. So let's go through the steps. And so we'll break this down into the 10 steps of hypothesis testing. And I know these seem like a lot of steps, and they are, there are 10 of them, but each one is really short, and we'll go through each one. So let's start with the first uh, step. And that is data. And what that really means is you have to have some data. So you have a population from which you take a sample. And from the sample you take some sort of data collection, whether that's uh, measurements, like what is their blood pressure, the average blood pressure, or some sort of count, like how many people died. But you got to collect some data. Okay, and then step two, we got to make some assumptions. And our assumptions really are based on our data. We want to know, is our data normally distributed? Or is it not normally distributed? We also want to know, do we know what the standard deviation is? Or do we have no idea what the standard deviation is? This is important because we're going to use this information later, right? As we saw in the previous videos, that's going to help us differentiate whether we need to use Z scores or T scores. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do, the next step, step number three, is hypotheses. And we really have two kinds of hypothesis. We have our null hypothesis, which we call H sub zero, and our alternative hypothesis, H sub A. And the null hypothesis is called null because usually it's the hypothesis that looks to see that there's no difference between two things. So no difference meaning null, meaning this little zero for no, and so that's why we call it the null hypothesis. Now the null hypothesis is the one that we're trying to test in our study. And the alternative hypothesis is the one that we kind of came in here looking to prove. So that's the one that might be consistent with our research hypothesis. So let's, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say that we come to, come to this research and we want to prove something. We want to prove that the uh, mean of a population is not equal to 50. So that is our research hypothesis, what, whatever the data is. That's what our goal is, okay? Our, we want to prove that the mean of that population is not equal to 50. So that would be our alternative hypothesis right here. So this is what we were trying to prove. Now remember, we, like in the previous video, we're going to say innocent until proven guilty. Here we're going to say we're going to actually try to test the opposite of this. So the opposite of this would be, you guessed it, that the mean is 50, right? And so let's look at a couple other possibilities that we could do. So let's say we had a study in which we, in, in, in our research, and we wanted to show that uh, something that the mean is greater than 50. So that's what we actually want to prove, right? So that would be our, our alternative hypothesis. So now we have to state a null hypothesis, and that would be just the opposite of this, which is that the mean is less than or equal to 50. And so you can see how our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis uh, complement each other, that they're actually the opposites. Let's look at one more. 
This should probably be no surprise to you if we want to try and prove our, our alternative hypothesis is that the mean, that mu, the population mean, is less than 50, then we would set as our null hypothesis that the population mean is greater than or equal to 50. So again, these are the opposites there. Okay, now let's go on. We're going to look at picking the test statistic. And we might use z-scores, right? And in a z-score, we know that our test statistic would be from the formula we saw before, which is the sample mean. This is our hypothesized mean, and we are assuming we know the standard deviation and the sample size, and so we get using z. But we could also just as easily use a t-score, right? Maybe we don't have the uh, normal population. And so the t statistic has a very uh, similar formula, except instead of using the known uh, standard deviation, we don't have one, so we have to use the samples uh, standard deviation. And so, so you might remember these denominators as the standard errors, right? This is the standard error, and this is the estimated standard error. And in fact, the formula for a test statistic really is the relevant statistic, which is usually going to be the sample mean, minus our hypothesized population parameter, which you know, we'll say this is my guess of what the mean really is, and this is the, the mean that I found in the sample, over the standard error of this statistic here. And so if we know the standard deviation, we can use the standard error. If not, we got to use the estimated standard error. And so that's our test statistic. And then we need to look at the distribution of that test statistic. And we talked about that already a little bit, that we want to know if this is going to be a Z or a T uh, distribution. And the sixth step is to look at the decision rule. And so what we're going to want to do is draw our distribution here. And if we convert everything to Z or T, we know that it'll have a mean of zero because that's just how these work, right? And what we want to do next then is set a significance level, which we call alpha. And what that is, is that, that alpha is the probability of having a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, that is indeed true, but our data says that it's wrong. Okay? And at what level are we going to believe that data? You know, up to what level? And uh, up to what probability? And so that's what that alpha represents. It's the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. I know you're saying, what the heck does that mean? So let me try and explain. So let's first just pick a, a level. Now, the commonly accepted alpha is 5%. So tradition or convention or whatever that says, we are willing to ha make a mistake of 5% of, of falsely rejecting something that is true, that we should have actually accepted it, but we didn't. Okay, and so what does that mean in terms of this distribution? Well, 5%, that's the probability. That means we want to, let's do a two-tailed test, meaning we want to we have 95% under here. So this area plus this area is 5%, and this equals 95%. So that means whenever we take a sample and we get our test statistic, uh, remember that's over here, 90, and, and if the null hypothesis is true, 95% of the time it's going to appear in here, and 5% of the time it's going to appear in here. So if it appears in here, then we accept the null hypothesis. So let's say our test statistic falls here or it falls here, or here, or even here, or over even here. Then, what would we do? Well, then we would accept the null hypothesis. Now, what if it falls in one of these areas over here? Then you guessed it. We would reject the null hypothesis. So if it is there, or there, or here, or here, then we would reject the null hypothesis. So we call these the areas of acceptance, and these the area, or non-rejection, and this is the area of rejection. So, really, we should say not accept, we should say don't reject. So, we talked about type 1 and type 2 error before. So, let's say that, um, what is type 1 error? Type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis. That means that is actually true. So, let's say the null hypothesis is true, but our test statistic, test statistic showed up in one of these rejection areas, right? Then we'd be making a type 1 error. Now, the opposite is if the test statistic was in the area of acceptance, acceptance, the area of non-rejecting, and yet that null hypothesis was actually false, right? And so that would be our type 2 error, or our beta 
error. Okay, we're almost done. I know this is a long video, but the last four steps, they're going to go somewhat quickly. Okay, so the next one is to calculate the test statistic, and we already know the formula for this. We looked at these earlier, and so now we have the data, right? From our sample, we get this. This is our guess, and we either calculate this, or we know this, and we know the sample size, right? So calculating the test statistic. The next step is to actually make a statistical decision, and this we know how to do already as well. Once we calculate the test statistic, we know already where it falls. Does it fall into one of these, you know, we just calculate it and we see where it falls. And in, in the next step, we make a decision, a conclusion, based on where that test statistic fell. So, and it's easy, right? If the test statistic falls in the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. If it falls within the accept or the don't reject region, then we accept the null hypothesis. And so if HO, the null hypothesis, is rejected, we can say, hey, let's, we think that our, we have evidence to support our alternative hypothesis. If we are unable to accept our, unable to reject, I'm sorry, unable to reject the null hypothesis, then we say, you know what, the null hypothesis may be true. I cannot say that my alternative hypothesis is true. And our final step is to calculate a p-value. And that is a probability what is the probability of getting a test statistic that is all the way over here, right? And we would calculate that from our Z table or our T table to say how, if, if this was true, if the null hypothesis was true, how likely is it that we got that test statistic? Was it pretty likely, like 40% chance, 60 or 80% chance? Was it very unlikely? Was it a 1% chance or a half percent chance? You know, we were going to accept it regardless if it was, you know, if there was a 5% chance Maybe it was even better than that. Maybe it was a, it was a one in a thousand shot, 0.1% chance. All right, and so these are the steps of hypothesis testing. And I went through them in a lot of detail. There, there are 10 steps, and it does look like a lot, but, but a lot of them are very simple, right? And so we're going to go through all of this in an example uh, when we continue on with hypothesis testing. I apologize this video ran long, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. Bye.